Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Last week, we brought you the first part of our list about notorious murders that happened in Los Angeles involving celebrities. Today, we're going to finish up that list, rounding it out with five more infamous cases. If you haven't seen the first video, make sure to check that one out before watching this one. For convenience, we've included a link in the description below. As a side note, the cases on this list are in no particular order, as we opted to spread the most well-known stories across the two videos for the sake of balance. Before we get to our list, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a bunch of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, make sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. As always, we are extremely grateful for everyone who has helped support the channel. With that out of the way, here is part two of 10 Notorious LA Murders Involving Celebrities. Ramon Navarro was born in 1899 in Durango City in the northwest of Mexico. His family emigrated in 1913 to escape the Mexican Revolution, settling in Los Angeles. The move would set the stage for Navarro to pursue a career in Hollywood. The actor landed his first few film roles in 1917, amidst the height of the silent film era. In only a few short years, Navarro would become one of Hollywood's most prominent leading men, achieving his greatest success in the 1925 epic Ben-Hur. He would continue to have a prosperous career even as the movie industry transitioned away from silent films, though his appearances would largely be confined to television towards the end of his life. Like with many celebrities, Navarro's personal life was far more turbulent than his professional life. Part of this can be attributed to his lifelong struggle with alcoholism, but much of it was due to the fact that he was a gay man in Hollywood at a time when living out publicly was not an option. Sadly, the secrecy surrounding his sexual identity would be a contributing factor to his murder. By the late 1960s, Navarro was an elderly and lonely bachelor who desperately sought companionship. He dealt with his isolation the only way he knew how, by paying for the company of younger men at his home in the neighborhood of Laurel Canyon. On October 30, 1968, brothers Paul and Tom Ferguson called Navarro and offered their sexual services. The 22- and 17-year-olds had gotten Navarro's number from a previous guest who the actor had contacted through an escort agency. When they arrived at Navarro's home, he invited them in and they quickly got to drinking. The evening started off fairly normally, with Navarro showing the young men songs he had composed on the piano, as well as old photographs of himself as he reminisced about his days in Hollywood. However, unbeknownst to Navarro, the Ferguson brothers had more sinister intentions for the evening. As the liquor continued to flow, things started to turn sour. Following a possible sexual encounter between the actor and the older Ferguson brother Paul, the young men started to demand $5,000 that Navarro was rumored to keep in his house. When Navarro told the Fergusons that he didn't keep such large sums of money in his home, things escalated to violence. The brothers began to savagely beat the naked actor while he begged for them to stop. At one point, they incorporated a cane they had found in a nearby closet into the beatings, aiming it at his head and genitals. To prevent Navarro from losing consciousness, they dragged him into the bathroom, where they splashed cold water on him in between blows. They also bound him with electrical cord so he couldn't fight back. When they grew tired of the violence, the Fergusons threw Navarro's pummeled body onto his bed. The actor would die from asphyxiation, the result of choking on his own blood. After murdering Navarro, Paul and Tom Ferguson ransacked his home in search of the money. However, the actor had been telling the truth. He didn't keep large sums on hand, and the killers eventually left with just $20. Before they did so, they scrawled a homophobic message on the bathroom mirror to make it seem like the murder had been committed by a vengeful woman upset about Navarro's sexuality. The tactic did not work, and the Fergusons were quickly arrested and charged with the actor's murder. At trial, Paul and Tom both insisted that the other had committed the violence, while they were innocent. Tom claimed that he had been in a different part of the house on a phone call, while Paul claimed that he had woken up after the murder and had no recollection of the killing. 
They were both found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. The trial judge recommended that they never be released. However, just a few short years later, both Fergusons would be back on the streets, with Paul serving a total of nine years and Tom serving just six. They would both eventually commit further crimes unrelated to Navarro's murder and would return to prison. Tom committed suicide in March of 2005, while Paul is currently serving a 60-year sentence for rape in Missouri. Today, Ramon Navarro is rightly remembered for his significant acting contributions during one of the golden ages of American cinema. There are few people more well-known for their contributions to American music than Marvin Gaye. The prolific artist's hits include such classics as How Sweet It Is and I Heard It Through the Grapevine, songs that would come to define the Motown era. However, despite Gay's success, he had persistent problems in his personal life. These issues extended back to the musician's childhood and sadly would ultimately be the cause of his death. From the time Gay was a boy, he had a bitter relationship with his father, Marvin Sr. Marvin Sr. was a Christian minister and was known as a strict disciplinarian who was often physically abusive towards his children. Though all of the children endured corporal punishment at the hands of their father, Gay reportedly received the worst of the treatment. According to his sister Jean, even into his teenage years, the musician's life was full of, quote, brutal whippings. Though Gay made several attempts to mend his relationship with his father over the course of his life, his success only seemed to make things worse. It is thought that Marvin Sr. was jealous of his son's success and could not handle the idea of him becoming the breadwinner of the family. Gay's father also reportedly resented the close relationship he had with his mother, Alberta. However, by the early 1980s, Gay had personal problems that extended beyond his family relationships. He ended up spending time outside of the country due to taxes he owed and sank into a cycle of substance abuse and depression. Though he managed to achieve a period of sobriety during his triumphant return to the top of the charts with the song Sexual Healing, he quickly turned back to abusing cocaine while on tour in the spring of 1983. The drug use caused Gay to develop paranoia and he began to believe that his life was in danger. As a result, he began to wear a bulletproof vest while not on stage during the tour. When the tour ended, Gay went to stay with his parents for an extended period of time while his mother recovered from kidney surgery. The home was located in the West Adams neighborhood of Los Angeles and was a property that Gay had purchased for them. While things were initially fine because Marvin Sr. was away on business, he returned in October and tensions began to rise in the house. During this time, Gay sank further into a paranoid depression and would often refuse to leave his room. On Christmas of that year, Gay bought his father a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol, something he believed would help his father protect himself from intruders. He likely had no idea that he had just purchased the weapon that would end his life. In the months before his death, Gay's mental condition continued to grow worse as tensions between his parents increased. Finally, in the spring, things came to a boiling point. At approximately 12.30 on April 1st, 1984, Marvin Sr. yelled at his wife over an insurance document the couple had been arguing about for several days. Angered by the way his father was treating his mother, Gay yelled down from his bedroom that if his father had something to say, he should do it in person. When Marvin Sr. charged upstairs and into Gay's bedroom to interrogate his wife about the document, Gay grew enraged. After telling his father to leave, and with Marvin Sr. refusing to do so, the men got into a physical altercation. Gay shoved his father into the hall and began kicking and punching him. His mother screamed for him to stop and was eventually able to separate them, after which Gay returned to his bedroom. Just minutes later, Marvin Sr. entered the room, wielding the Smith & Wesson pistol. He fired two shots, one into Gay's chest and the other at point-blank range. According to Gay's brother Frankie, who entered the house just moments after the shooting, Gay's dying words were that he had gotten what he had wanted, saying that he couldn't have done it himself and that there was no more left in him. Gay was rushed to hospital where he was pronounced dead less than half an hour later. Marvin Sr. would later plead no contest to voluntary manslaughter in connection with his son's death. During his sentencing, he tearfully told the court that he wished that he could bring back his son and that he hadn't known what was going to happen. He claimed that he had been afraid and that he had feared for his life. On November 2nd, 1984, he was given a six-year suspended sentence and five years of probation. The list of tributes and dedications to Marvin Gaye following his death are too numerous to mention and were deeply felt by both his fans and the music industry more broadly. He died just one day before his 45th birthday. While fame and recognition in the music industry have traditionally been confined to the musicians themselves, 
Phil Spector managed to break that mold in a huge way. In 1960, at the age of 21, Spector became the youngest person ever to own a U.S. record label and would go on to have a distinguished career as a producer and songwriter. Throughout the 1960s, he produced records for artists like The Crystals, The Renettes, and Ike and Tina Turner, working with recording engineer Larry Levine and the legendary session musicians known as The Wrecking Crew. But what Spector is best known for is the way in which he introduced the idea of the recording studio into the music production process as an instrument in its own right, pioneering a technique which would come to be known as the wall of sound. He achieved this by using large ensembles of instruments in his arrangements, layering multiple tracks on top of each other and combining them with effects such as delay, reverb, and distortion to create rich, full tones that became a signature sound of popular music of the era. Artists from the Beatles to Leonard Cohen to the Ramones all worked with Spectre over the course of his career and benefited from his signature sound. However, in 1974, Spectre's life almost came to an abrupt end when he got into a serious car crash in Hollywood. According to reports, he was thrown through the windshield of his vehicle and might have been pronounced dead at the scene if it weren't for an officer who noticed Spectre's faint pulse. He was rushed to hospital, where surgery was performed to address his extensive head injuries. He would receive hundreds of stitches to his face and the back of his head. While Spectre continued to work to some degree following the accident, he became increasingly reclusive. He also reportedly began to exhibit erratic behavior, often wearing bizarre wigs and leaning more heavily into drugs and alcohol. There were also rumors that he would sometimes lash out violently against the artist he worked with though these stories were never confirmed. According to D.D. Dee Dee Ramon, Spectre once pulled a gun on him when he attempted to leave a session, though this account is also disputed. As the years dragged on, Spectre fell further out of the public eye. Beginning in the 1980s, little was reported about the producer for more than 20 years. That is, until he was accused of murder. In the early morning hours of February 3rd, 2003, struggling actress Lena Clarkson was found dead in Spectre's mansion, the Pyrenees Castle. Clarkson had met the producer while working at the House of Blues in Los Angeles. After leaving the establishment, the two headed to Spectre's mansion in his limousine. While they were inside, driver Adriano D'Souza waited in the vehicle. About an hour later, a 911 call was placed from the house by D'Souza. During the call, Spectre was quoted as saying, I think I've killed someone. D'Souza also told police that he saw Spectre come out of the back door of his home with a gun in his hand, though investigators would later find no fingerprints on the weapon. From the beginning, Spectre claimed that Clarkson's death was an accidental suicide, saying that the actress had, quote, kissed the gun. Clarkson's body was found by investigators slumped over in a chair with a single gunshot wound to her mouth. Her broken teeth were reportedly scattered all over the carpet. Authorities did not buy Spectre's version of events, and he was put on trial for Clarkson's murder in 2007. The producer would go through at least three prominent attorneys before and during the trial, including O.J. Simpson lawyer Robert Shapiro, John Gotti lawyer Bruce Cutler, and attorney Linda Kenny Baden, who would eventually be involved in the trials of Casey Anthony, Michael Skakel, and Aaron Hernandez. While the defense sought to prove that Clarkson's death had been a suicide, the prosecution claimed that she had been murdered, introducing testimony from several women that they said showed a disturbing trend of similar occurrences involving Spectre. According to the prosecution, Spectre had previously pulled a gun on four different women. In each case, he had been drinking and had been, quote, romantically interested in the woman, but grew angry after the woman spurned him. The court proceedings ultimately ended in a mistrial after a hung jury was stuck at 10 to 2 in favor of conviction. Spectre was retried for the killing in October of 2008, this time resulting in a conviction of second-degree murder. In 2009, he was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. Following the decision, Spectre filed numerous appeals, but all of them were denied. Though Spectre would have been eligible for parole in 2024, by pure coincidence, he died just this past week while we were writing this script, at the age of 81. While some may feel that politicians shouldn't be included on a list of celebrities, 
It's undeniable that America has something of an obsession when it comes to the Kennedy family. Additionally, next to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, there's few other cases in U.S. history that have been the source of as much speculation and conspiracy as the murder of Robert Kennedy. Kennedy first came to prominence while working as chief counsel of the Senate Labor Rackets Committee from 1957 to 1959, where he went after Teamsters President Jimmy Hoffa over the union's corruption. He resigned to manage his brother's 1960 presidential election campaign and was appointed U.S. Attorney General after JFK was elected. He remained his brother's closest advisor until his assassination in 1963, after which he began to nurture his own political ambitions. He resigned from the Johnson administration to run for a New York Senate seat, beating out Republican incumbent Kenneth Keating in 1964. While in office, Kennedy took on several causes that significantly raised his political profile. He opposed U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War and took on various human rights and social justice issues in Eastern Europe, Central and South America, and South Africa. In 1968, Kennedy decided to enter the presidential race after watching Lyndon Johnson's polling numbers fall as well as the success of other contenders in the primary race. When Johnson dropped out completely, his chances started to look promising as he strove to overtake Senator Eugene McCarthy and Vice President Hubert Humphrey. On June 4th, the California primaries were held, putting Kennedy ahead of McCarthy. It looked as though Kennedy now had a promising path to the nomination. Shortly after midnight, Kennedy addressed his supporters in the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel in L.A.'s Mid-Wilshire District. With excitement in the air, many people had gathered and were eager to meet Kennedy and shake hands. After his speech ended, one of Kennedy's campaign aides agreed that he would hold a press conference. This was a change of earlier plans, which had originally been for Kennedy to meet with a second group of supporters elsewhere in the hotel. In order to bypass this area, Kennedy was led through the hotel's kitchen, located behind the ballroom, which would take him into the press area. However, a crowd of excited supporters quickly followed behind and the area became congested as Kennedy and his campaign officials proceeded through. As he was walking, Kennedy was still stopping to shake hands with those who greeted him. When he stopped to shake hands with a young busboy named Juan Romero, a man quickly stepped down from an area near the kitchen's ice machine and rushed towards Kennedy. The man drew a revolver and repeatedly shot towards Kennedy, who was struck and fell to the floor. The man who shot Kennedy was named Sirhan Sirhan, a Palestinian Arab born in Jerusalem. As his diary would later show, Sirhan had strongly anti-Zionist beliefs, and it is thought that he became obsessed with Kennedy because of his support of Israel. Many believe that the date of the assassination, June 5th, was meant to coincide with the anniversary of the Six-Day War, the conflict that had taken place the previous year between Israel and its Arab neighbors. As Kennedy lay dying on the ground, he reportedly asked Romero if everyone was okay. Sirhan was eventually wrestled into submission by Kennedy's unofficial bodyguards. Kennedy was taken to the hospital approximately 30 minutes later and rushed into surgery. However, even after the emergency procedure, he showed little sign of improvement and eventually died as a result of his injuries, 26 hours after the shooting had taken place. Though Kennedy's assassination was not nearly as traumatizing to the American public as his brothers had been five years earlier, it nonetheless had a significant impact on the nation's psyche and on the short-term outcome of the presidential election. Hubert Humphrey would eventually secure the nomination as the Democratic candidate and would go on to lose to Richard Nixon. For many, Kennedy's death signaled an end to the optimism for social change that had characterized much of the 60s. Like with the assassination of JFK, Robert Kennedy's murder gave rise to an unstoppable tide of conspiracy theories. Among these theories was that Kennedy's death was planned and executed by the CIA, with some claiming that several people seen at the Ambassador Hotel on the night of the assassination were CIA operatives. Similar to JFK, there is widespread disagreement even among conspiracy theorists as to who delivered the fatal blow to Robert Kennedy, with some believing the second shooter was involved, and others believing that Sirhan was indeed the gunman, but that he was psychologically programmed to commit the murder. There is also significant speculation about the so-called woman in the polka dot dress, a supposed attendee that night that multiple witnesses would later claim to have seen in various locations at the Ambassador Hotel. Despite the many theories about the case, no definitive evidence has ever emerged to suggest that Sirhan was not the shooter or that he did not act alone. In 1969, he was convicted of Kennedy's assassination and sentenced to death. This was later commuted to life in 1972 after California's death penalty rules were declared unconstitutional. Of all of the cases on today's list, none are as famous or as controversial as the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, 
which resulted in the subsequent trial of NFL running back O.J. Simpson. Though Simpson largely made his way into popular culture as an athlete, by the time of the Brown-Goldman murders, he was a more general celebrity figure. He had been cast in several small film and television roles throughout his NFL career, beginning to pursue acting more earnestly following his retirement from football in 1979. In June of 1977, Simpson met Nicole Brown while she was working at a Beverly Hills nightclub called The Daisy. Brown had turned 18 just three weeks before, coinciding with her graduation from high school. She had reportedly never heard of Simpson before the chance encounter, but the two would quickly begin dating. At the time, Simpson was married to his wife of almost 10 years, Margaret Whitley, with whom he had three children. He would divorce Whitley in 1979 to be with Brown. Though Brown and Simpson would not marry until 1985, the young Brown immediately put her life plans on hold for the new relationship, dropping out of college just a few months after her enrollment to move in with Simpson. She would later say that she did this because Simpson, quote, required that she be with him, an early sign of the obsession and volatility that would later come to characterize both sides of their relationship. In the meantime, however, any signs of cracks in the relationship remained largely hidden from the public view. The same year that the couple married, Simpson was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Brown and Simpson had their first child a few months later, and would have one more in 1988. During these years, they held frequent parties with friends and family, occasions that even after the shocking events of the next few years, many close to them would still remember fondly. According to Brown's family and those close to her, there were many not-so-subtle signs of problems in the marriage. Brown would frequently cancel plans at the last minute, and the couple would often fail to show up at places where they were supposed to be. Behind the scenes, Simpson was physically and emotionally abusive. Over the course of their seven-year marriage, there were reportedly more than 60 incidents of physical abuse alone, in which the police were called at least eight times. Simpson would be arrested just a single time, pleading no contest to spousal abuse in 1989. Brown's reluctance to get police involved was due in large part to her financial dependence on Simpson. She had signed a prenuptial agreement before the marriage, and Simpson prevented her from working during their relationship. The abuse would follow a predictable cycle of injury, followed by an emotional apology from Simpson and sometimes an extravagant gift. Still, by 1992, Brown was done with the relationship, and she filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. This was followed by a brief and final reconciliation attempt that failed, after which Brown tried to move on with her life. However, Simpson seemingly could not do the same. In the months after the divorce, he began stalking and harassing his ex-wife, behaviors that only increased in their severity as time went on. During one notable incident in October of 1993, Brown called 911 after Simpson showed up at her Brentwood home in a rage. At one point in the call, he could be heard yelling about a sexual encounter Brown had had with her new boyfriend. He was referencing the time that he had spied on them through one of the home's windows a year earlier. The disturbing 13 and a half minute phone call would later be played at trial. Finally came the infamous night of June 12th, 1994. That evening, Brown and Simpson separately attended their daughter's dance recital, after which Brown and her family went to eat at the Mezzaluna restaurant. After dinner, Brown and her children went for ice cream before returning home. At approximately 9.30 p.m., the manager of Mezzaluna received a phone call from Brown's mother, informing her that she had forgotten her glasses at the restaurant. A waiter, Ron Goldman, offered to drop them off at Brown's house approximately 20 minutes later, as he and Brown had become close friends in the previous weeks. Shortly after 10 p.m., a neighbor of Brown started to hear her white Akita dog barking. Just before 11, another neighbor came across the dog barking in the alley. Though the dog was unharmed, it appeared to have blood on its paws. It followed the man home, after which another resident, Sukru Bostep, agreed to look after it overnight. Bostep would later tell investigators that the dog remained restless after he brought it into his home, so he decided to take it back out for a walk. The distressed animal led Bostep to the front gate of the Brown residence, where he saw a woman lying in a pool of blood. 
When police arrived on the scene, the full carnage of the situation was finally discovered. Brown was face down and barefoot at the bottom of the stairs leading to her front door, which had been left wide open. Goldman's body was close by, lying between a tree and the fence. Though there was a large amount of blood at the scene, Brown's feet were clean, causing investigators to speculate that she had been the intended target of the attack. She had sustained multiple vicious knife wounds to her head and neck, the last of which severed her carotid artery. Due to the bruising on her back, police concluded that the killer had stabbed Brown numerous times, murdered Goldman, and then returned and slit her throat, putting a foot on her back while her head was pulled towards the killer. Goldman, meanwhile, had been stabbed repeatedly in the neck and chest. Next to his body, investigators discovered two items that they believed to belong to the killer. A blue knit cap and an extra-large Aries Isotoner light leather glove. The glove appeared to be a match to a pair that Brown had given Simpson for Christmas a few years earlier, and would become one of the most infamous and memorable moments of the ensuing trial. Also discovered at the scene were bloody shoe prints that led to the back gate, accompanied by drops of blood. Both of these were presumed to have been left by the killer. Soon after it was realized that Nicole Brown was one of the victims, LAPD detectives arrived at Simpson's Rockingham Avenue mansion to inform him of the murder and take him to his children. However, upon arriving, they received no answer after buzzing at the front gate. Noticing blood on the door of Simpson's white Ford Bronco, the detectives became concerned that something was wrong and scaled the wall surrounding the property to gain access. During their inspection, they found a bloody glove, the matching right hand to the other glove that had been found at the murder scene. Police felt the evidence gave them probable cause to issue an arrest warrant for Simpson. Simpson was first taken in for questioning on June 13th, where detectives noticed a cut on his left hand. When asked about the injury, Simpson first told the investigators that he had cut himself accidentally upon learning about Brown's death, but changed his story once they informed him about the blood found in the door of his vehicle. A sample of his blood was taken, and he was released. The following day, Simpson hired lawyer Robert Shapiro, who began to assemble a group of defense lawyers that would later become known as the Dream Team. These lawyers included Johnny Cochran, Barry Sheck, and Alan Dershowitz, as well as one of Simpson's longtime friends, Robert Kardashian. On June 17th, DNA test results taken from the crime scene came back as a match to Simpson. Police informed Shapiro that first-degree murder charges would be laid against his client in the Brown and Goldman killings, and that he would need to surrender that day. It was agreed that Simpson would be allowed to surrender himself, and was afforded extra time to set some affairs in order and visit a mental health professional for his increasingly fragile mental state. During this time, Simpson wrote three sealed letters, one to his children, one to his mother, and one to the public. However, when the time came for Simpson's surrender, he never showed up. Police declared Simpson a fugitive and put out an all-points bulletin for him. Simpson's public letter was read by Kardashian at approximately 5 p.m., which showed obvious signs of Simpson's distressed mental state. Much of the content of the letter seemed to suggest that he planned to commit suicide. Authorities were eventually able to track Simpson down thanks to motorist sightings as well as a 911 call he made from his cell phone. He was first seen by police heading north on Interstate 405 in a white Ford Bronco driven by his friend Al Cowlings. At this time, it was noticed that Simpson had a gun to his head and a low-speed chase ensued, with up to 20 police cars at a time trailing Simpson and Cowling. News helicopters would also join in on the action, broadcasting footage on every major news channel in what would become one of the most memorable moments in U.S. television history. As the pursuit continued, people who knew Simpson pleaded with him to surrender peacefully over the radio, while others, including police, were able to talk to him directly on his cell phone. The chase ended at approximately 8 p.m., when the Bronco pulled into Simpson's Brentwood estate. Simpson remained in the vehicle for almost an hour before exiting. He was allowed to enter his home and talk to his mother for another hour before finally surrendering. If the entire case up until this point had been a spectacle, it was nothing compared to the eventual trial. Of particular concern was how the sheer volume of media coverage would affect the neutrality of the proceedings. Nonetheless, it was televised via CCTV cameras on Court TV, as well as various network news outlets. 
The trial began on January 24, 1995, and would last 134 days. The prosecution's case was fairly straightforward, that the domestic violence within the Brown-Simpson marriage had ultimately culminated in Brown's murder. They pointed to the mountain of evidence of violence in the relationship, saying that an argument that had taken place between Simpson and Brown on the night of their daughter's dance recital had been the breaking point for Simpson. The prosecution also relied on the ample DNA evidence and blood trail at the scene which had proven to be a match to Simpson, as well as hair and fiber evidence and shoe print analysis. The defense, meanwhile, summarized their case with four points. Compromised, contaminated, corrupted, and covered up. They would go on to argue that evidence had been mishandled by investigators during the collection phase, and that the real killer's DNA had vanished from the evidence samples. They further claimed that the LAPD contaminated the evidence at their crime lab, and that exhibits had been planted and corrupted in brazen acts of police fraud. Though at first this started as a claim that only three exhibits had been planted, the defense would eventually argue that nearly all of the blood evidence against Simpson was part of a police conspiracy. The trial proceeded with the opposing sides leaning into two very different methods of argumentation, with the prosecution attempting to outmaneuver the defense by showing that their theories had no credible basis in the science, and the defense trying to rhetorically outmaneuver the prosecution by casting doubt on forensic techniques and attacking the credibility of the police and their investigation. The most well-known example of this is from the infamous Bloody Glove, found during the police search of Simpson's property. While the prosecution focused on the reliability of the blood evidence, citing the various infinitesimally small probabilities of error in their samples, the defense claimed that the glove had been planted and that the police corruption had racial motivation. To add validity to this claim, they played audio tapes of Detective Mark Furman that had been recorded eight years prior, in which he had used the N-word 41 times. When Simpson was asked to put on the gloves during the trial, he appeared to struggle to do so, leading lawyer Johnny Cochran to utter his famous phrase, If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The prosecution claimed that the gloves had likely shrunk due to being soaked by the blood of the victims. This was attested to by the former vice president of the glove maker, and when a new pair of gloves was produced, they appeared to fit Simpson. On the morning of October 3rd, 1995, an estimated 100 million people worldwide tuned in to hear the jury's verdict in the case. It is rumored that so many people were watching the proceedings that long-distance phone call volumes decreased by over 50%, and that there were noticeable drops in water usage and trading volume on the New York Stock Exchange. Simpson was acquitted on both counts of murder. In the immediate aftermath of the verdict, reactions were felt keenly along racial lines with the majority of black Americans surveyed claiming that justice had been served and that Simpson had been framed, and the majority of white Americans believing the opposite. These feelings were exacerbated not only due to the theories raised by the defense at trial, but also the racial makeup of the jury, which was overwhelmingly black despite a relatively mixed jury pool. However, over the years, a majority of people from all backgrounds would eventually come to believe Simpson was guilty. In interviews following the trial, several jurors said that they believed Simpson probably committed the murders, but that they felt the prosecution had failed to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. In 1996, the families of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown filed civil suits against Simpson. The civil trial would ultimately find Simpson responsible for the murders, with Brown and Simpson's children awarded $12.6 million, and the victims' families awarded an additional $33.5 million in compensatory and punitive damages. However, neither of these trials ever managed to satiate the public appetite for speculation about the case, and in the years since, a plethora of books, movies, and other media have examined the murders. These works have been created by a multitude of people involved in the case, most notably Simpson himself in his infamously titled book, If I Did It. That brings us to the end of our list. Know of any other cases like this that you'd like to see covered in a future video? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.